Hello, this is Domine de Groot from Audio Epics. And this is Eileen Hoskins, the voice of Samina. And we're here today to announce the 11th chapter of Witch Hunter. That's right, that means that there's only one episode left after this one. I hope you really enjoy it. Next episode is not going to be the last one. We will have much more up our sleeves in the future. But yeah, chapter 12 will be the, uh, let's just say, the, the big finale of the story so far. So we hope you really enjoyed the almost final episode of Witch Hunter. Domina. Bright red lightning flashed several times at once in different parts of the city. The lightning always struck in the same ten places the witch hunters had come to call entry points. With each flash, new demonic servants of Lucas poured out of the ground from one of the entry points. The Great Triangle and the Trade Quarter were aflame once more. There had even been lightning outside of the city, reaching as far as the Wild World. Giant black wolves, eyes like burning coal, roamed the streets. Charred human bodies with glistening eyes moved with superhuman agility and speed, burying their smoldering claws in the backs of fleeing civilians. Bats, the size of eagles, circled the taller buildings, now and then swooping down to bloody their fangs. The giant ravens had returned as well, but even these monsters, who could snap a man's spine in their beaks, weren't the worst creatures threatening the civilians of Seven Peaks. There were also the pure demons. Blood-red giants, twenty feet tall, their heads adorned with massive curled horns. Living nightmares. Hundreds of crossbowmen and riflemen forced to shoot into the city had volleyed these monsters from the city walls. While they had succeeded in bringing down a few of the beasts, it didn't matter if the lightning flashes continued. Entire buildings had been toppled by ever more monsters. Lady Hoskiv demanded constant reports from the city, no matter how discouraging they were. She did everything she could to manage the defense of the city, but she knew it was an impossible task. If she sent reinforcements to the historical center, the defenses on the city walls weakened. If she sent her best troops there where the enemy was strongest, to keep him from approaching too close to the cathedral, she would lose those troops before the next worse wave of attack. The simple truth was that this battle, if it could even be called one, was unwinnable. Seven Peaks would fall before long, and she knew it. Her only goal now was to postpone the inevitable fall for as long as possible and to defend the goddess's cathedral to the bitter end. Meanwhile, the city's inhabitants were being slaughtered, but there was not much more she could do beyond sending some troops to escort the refugees out of the city. And what awaited them there, she did not know. Every warrior who helped civilians escape to the plains of Evenendale or the Wildwood was one less to defend Seven Peaks and the cathedral. Lady Hoskiv stood bent over a map of the city, which lay spread on a table in the prayer room of a small side chapel inside the cathedral. Tall copper candelabras lit the dark marble-framed room. Behind the colorful rose window, light flickered in silence, the light that supplied the endless monsters. Bowing her head, Lady Hoskiv closed her eyes. She wasn't thinking about the map, She was waiting for a miracle. What if an eleventh entry point appeared? Anything was possible. Already the monsters had been seen inside the historical center, destroying some of the oldest and most beautiful patrician estates in Seven Peaks. The guards and even some ordinary folk had fought bravely, but they would soon be outnumbered. Strategy made no difference. They were being wiped out. Lady Hoskiv, 
She was not displeased to be pulled out of her somber thoughts by the careful voice. New creatures have been seen. She gave the young witch hunter who had addressed her a sidelong glance. I've seen them myself, lady. They look like giants. Giants of liquid fire. No bullet, no arrow, no blade can harm them. What do you mean? I mean... We can't beat them. It's impossible, lady. There were tears in his eyes. They are coming this way. Lady Hoskiv bit her lips. Very well then, she thought. Then it is time. The lad looked puzzled. What do you mean, my lady? The end, my young friend. The end of Seven Peaks? The end of everything? Tears flowed openly from the young man's face. A young man he might be, but he was still a witch hunter. Recover your strength, boy. This is an honor. Be ready to die as a true defender of Seven Peaks. He shook his head so slightly it looked more like he was simply quivering with terror. <laughs> but, but, but what must we do, lady? We can't win. No, we cannot. But we can show them the fire in our souls even in the bitter last minute of Seven Peaks. She grabbed the young witch hunter by the arm. He looked at her, and she stared back into his eye, fearless. Listen to me, friend, and pass this on to everyone you meet. The hour has now come. Do not give in to fear. Do not let them touch your soul. Rejoice. The hour has come to meet your goddess. First protect her city and her tower to the very end, and then welcome death. In the distance, Ludlov saw the black blade gleam in the light of the hundreds of torches. I am sorry, Samina, but this has to happen. Keep that weapon away from me! Seven drops in one. That sounded like a quote from a book Ludlov didn't know. It is an ancient prophecy. Brought to us from the word of Wolfen himself. The word of Wolfen? Ludlov had heard of that mythical book of prophecy. Its very existence was the stuff of legend and campfire tales. On the edge of the abyss shall the last age dawn. The blood of the maiden shall take up the weapon of Lucus, evil no more, and her sacrifice shall end his reign. The prophecy is clear. You will wield the Black Sickle, and you will die, defeating Lucus. Make the sacrifice only you can make, Samina. Ludlov couldn't stay here and watch anymore. Enough! He emerged from his hideout. Enough! The madness ends here. He strode over the narrow bridge, ignoring the indescribable depth underneath him. Ludlov, finally. It is good that you are here. Ludlov drew his pistol and loaded it as he closed the distance between Adomir and himself. You will not touch her. I swear I will shoot you to death before you can harm one hair on her head. The teacher shook his head. Ludlow. He spoke with the bemusement of a father reigning in a stubborn child. You did your work well, Adomir. You found the pure blood and brought her to the edge of the abyss. Adomir inclined his head in appreciation of Ludlov's insight. I know what you would try to achieve. Sigurd glanced at Adomir, who remained in place, patient and immobile. 
So that's why you brought Samina here. To have her sacrifice her life. Correct, old friend. Ludlov ignored him. This monster had no right to call him friend. But you spoke of Maria. What do you know of her death? Adomir straightened his back and met Ludlov's gaze. Everything. Ludlov felt his very bones quivering with anger, but he maintained his controlled posture. You must understand. Adomir clasped his hands behind his back as he began to stroll across the width of the balcony. My life's purpose was and is to keep Lucas from returning, no matter what sacrifices are necessary for that. To achieve that goal, I had to follow the prophecy. I needed the woman in whose blood flowed all seven tears. For a moment, I thought your wife was the one, Ludlow. She did have pure blood in her. Unfortunately, I was too enthusiastic. I told her what I suspected, and she wasn't willing to cooperate. She was... unable to make the sacrifice. Ludlov ground his teeth. He pushed back the image of Adomir threatening Maria in his home while he was out. He had crossed the bridge now, aiming his pistol at Sigurd he took place beside Semina. Adomir stayed at a safe distance. It turned out I was wrong. Maria was not the one. She only carried three of the bloodlines in her veins. However, she was useful to me. With his left hand, Ludlov slowly drew the dagger that hung sheathed on his belt, holding the grip in his fist like he would hold a stake with which to pierce a vampire's heart. Adomir simply continued his explanation in utter calmness and control. He had always had that poise, that fearless serenity. Now, there was a hint of satisfaction to it, even glee, unlike anything Ludlov had ever seen in his mentor. To keep Lucas from rising, I needed a pure blood who would be able to defeat him. And I needed Lucas's weapon, the Black Sickle. And I knew who had it. The followers of Cardinal Voronitz's original cult of the Black Sickle. Despite his rising fury, Ludlov's naturally inquisitive mind still yearned to know more. What did Adomir mean by the original cult? Was he not the teacher, the head of the Black Sickle? Within that cult, the Sickle had been passed from master to pupil for hundreds of years. There was one way to be found worthy enough to rise to the state of guardianship over the Sickle. He stopped pacing over the balcony and faced Ludlov's glare, albeit from a distance. To kill a pure blood woman, a descendant of the maiden, using the sickle itself. And so, I entered the Black Sickle cult and became the new guardian of their sacred weapon. A blinding surge of hatred pierced Ludlov's heart. Without thinking, he changed the aim of his pistol from Sigurd to Adomir. He fired a bullet that landed straight in the middle of Adomir's chest. The elder witch hunter stumbled back and fell. Ludlov spun to face Sigurd, but to his surprise the young masked one simply remained where he was, holding the devil's own weapon with ceremonial reverence in both hands. Ludlov eyed Sigurd warily, keeping a firm grip on both his unloaded pistol and his drawn dagger. Ludlov! Samina inclined her head to point towards the fallen Adomir. Ludlov turned. Adomir had already crawled upright and stood in his original position, confident and undeterred. The unnaturalness of what had happened didn't even register in Ludlov's mind. So consumed was he by hatred. He charged, holding the dagger in his left hand high. 
He leaped up in order to strike down on Adomir with the weapon, but Adomir simply deflected him with a careless gesture of his right arm, easily throwing Ludlov off, who found himself plummeting down onto the balcony's tiled floor. He lost his grip on his pistol, which fell down with a reverberant clatter. He still had his dagger and his rapier, though. He got up and slowly circled around Adomir, who remained as poised and implacable as ever. Ludlov didn't know where the supernatural strength of the burned-up man had come from, but he realized he needed a different approach. He threw the dagger from his left hand to his right, spinning it in the air so that he could hold it with the blade up instead of down. This way he would be able to stab with his right arm fully extended. He would need speed and reflexes, not brute force. Adomir, Sigurd and Samina all looked at him as he knelt down and picked up his pistol, all the while eyeing Adomir carefully. He tucked his firearm under his belt once more. Ludlov realized he would probably not have the time to load and fire it again, but he wanted to keep the weapon close to him. Adomir seemed almost amused as he watched the man who had once been his favored pupil circle him like a hungry lion, ready to attack. The rational, well-trained combatant within Ludlov started asking questions. Why didn't Sigurd do anything? One man, even a formidable witch hunter, would be powerless against the two of them. Yet the young magician simply watched. Ludlov had faced groups of deadly enemies before, from bandits to wild creatures and supernatural monsters, but never had he seen an enemy's ally that had every opportunity to strike and didn't use that power. The sheer confidence that projected from both Adomir and Sigurd was unnerving. Still, the emotional Ludlov, the man who had waited seven years to avenge his wife, the man who had been betrayed by his most admired friend, now governed the actions of his body. That man decided to rush forward and attack Adomir again. As he approached, he could see Adomir's arms moving to sweep him aside once more, but this time Ludlov ducked, knelt and thrust his blade upward, sticking it right underneath the teacher's ribcage. Ludlov roared with rage as he got up and stuck the dagger more deeply, twisting it in his enemy's gut. Adomir simply laughed and threw Ludlov off with the casualness of a bull sweeping its tail to get rid of the flies on its rump. Ludlov fell down on his back and saw Adomir pull out the dagger. The weapon had stuck so deep that even the edge of its handle was inside Adomir's body. There was no blood. Instead, grey ashes came swishing down from the open wound. Adomir took the dagger and threw it over the balcony. It disappeared into the dark without a sound. Ludlov still had his rapier. It was a slower weapon, but... No. He was powerless. He sat there, looking up into the smugness in Adomir's ruined features, and all the frustration of the past seven years came boiling up, threatening to drown him. I'm sorry, Ludlov. You can't have revenge on me. Ludlov heard the words, but wouldn't allow his mind to fully process them. Never before had it been so difficult for him to simply get up. But he did it, knowing that if he stayed on that balcony floor for one more moment, he wouldn't be able to summon the will anymore to rise. As he got up, he looked at Samina. She simply stood there, hands and feet still bound in chains. You must understand, Maria's death was a sacrifice that needed to be made. I truly am sorry. He was sorry. He was sorry? Ludlov straightened his back and stared at Adomir. He maintained a cold gaze, but he felt dazed. It was as if he wasn't really present. It was all just a story being told to him. Still, his rational mind was aware that his detachment was simply due to a state of shock. That part of him also realized that he really was standing at the edge of the abyss, and that the murderer of his wife, an undefeatable monster, stood in front of him. He forced himself to believe his own senses. For what you did to her, and to me, 
You will pay a thousand times, Adomir. Your sacrifice will be the greatest. Oh, I have made great sacrifices, Ludlove. I've allowed myself to be burned alive, tasted the fire that houses Lucas just like Voronitz did so many centuries ago. The fire I tried to save you from! You did that to yourself? You wanted to burn? It was the only way I would be allowed, Ludlove. It is part of the Black Sickle's rite of passage into Lucas's full grace. Having lived through a baptism of fire, I can no longer die a mortal's death nor see the goddess's realm afterwards. I gave up my own soul. I did all of this to keep Lucas from returning. I know what's at stake. I know that horrible sacrifices will be needed. You were my greatest pupil, but you still don't have any idea of what sacrifice really means. Samina doesn't deserve this. He glanced towards her. As he did so, all the rage he felt quieted down for a moment. Samina met his gaze with a mysterious expression. She was terrified, of course, but beneath that, he could see something else. Something that overthrew both his hatred and the looming defeatism in the background. Something that stirred his heart and brought him a tiny measure of peace. Something he could only describe as grace. Sacrifices must be made, Ludlove. Sigurd spoke flatly from behind his raven mask. Be quiet, Sigurd. Ludlove was surprised at his own calmness. I have seen and heard enough of you. He looked at Samina again. Don't be afraid. I will free you. Her terrified look softened, and the grace beneath rose even more to the surface. He knew she had heard him. He will soon be here. Samina will need to be ready. Sigurd gave the witch hunter a nod. Go ahead, Ludlove. Loosen her chains. Ludlove understood. They were ready to unleash her. To use her as the ultimate weapon against Lucas. It was insanity. Still, if he could help her by freeing her from that awful metal, he would. And so he passed Sigurd, knelt down and started loosening the chain around her feet. What does he want, Ludlow? He looked up to her. She was staring at Adomir. Glancing back, Ludlow saw Adomir's twisted face contort in a smile. An amused chuckle escaped the teacher. <laughs> what do I want? I want nothing, Samina. Nothing for myself, at least. I simply wish to protect Seven Peaks from Lucas, the devil himself, about to rise out of the abyss where we now stand. I only wish to see the only weapon that can defeat him, his own black sickle, wielded by the only person who can defeat him. You. This has been my purpose all these years, right up to this moment. Having seen what was happening in the city, Ludlov believed that Lucas was about to rise, but forcing Samina to sacrifice her life to slay him, he bowed his head and sighed, shaking his head. <sighs> it's madness, Samina. It's madness. That monster will kill you. Ludlov? He expected her to protest and immediately interrupted. Lucas is no mere demon, Samina. He is a fallen archangel. He is the mightiest spirit ever brought forth by the goddess herself. And he is the original demon from whom all others have spawned. If he rises, I'm not sure he can be defeated. 
The massive nose beak of Sigurd's mask moved quickly as he shook his head. Sacrifice can defeat him, Witch Hunter. The most potent of the seven virtues, the one born by the pure blood who was my sister's namesake. It is not a coincidence. In his heart, Ludlov sensed Sigurd spoke the truth. But what it implied... She will make this sacrifice, as she is the only one who can. Allow her to do so. Allow her? You mean force her? This is not sacrifice. True sacrifice is a willful act on the part of the sacrificed. Yes, we are forcing her. For the sake of all humanity. Look beyond your own affection for this woman, Ludlov. Sigurd is able to do that, and he is her next of kin. You have no right to do this to her! She will die! Adomir took a deep breath. She will. And perhaps you are right, Ludlov. Perhaps I do not have the right to decide over one woman's life. But what right do you have to sacrifice all of humanity for the sake of your own moral instincts? Ludlov closed his eyes. He had never imagined himself harboring ill will towards Adomir, but this day he had come to passionately hate him. He wished he could take revenge on this monstrous teacher, but as hard as it was to accept, the prophecy could be trusted. Ludlov had to admit to the practical sense of Adomir's plan, as callous as it was. The silver tears, the light Samina could produce, he knew she was extraordinary. She was pure blood. He wondered how Adomir could have found out she carried all the bloodlines, but he believed it. Even among pure bloods, he knew Samina was special. If Lucas indeed rose tonight, no one could do anything to send him back to hell. No one at all. Except, maybe, Samina. He got up, took a deep breath and loosened the chains on her hands. When he had done so, he grabbed her shoulders. Samina. She was stunned. The grace in her features was now hidden behind a cloud of fear. Ludlov, I'm not ready for this. He clenched his jaws. Of course she wasn't. But if it's necessary... Samina, no. No. She looked away from him. Ludlov cocked his head, trying to meet her eyes. Silver tears glistened as she met his gaze once more. I'm sorry. She stroked the rough stubble on his face with the curious softness of a woman who had just found the man she would love for the rest of her life. I didn't. Ludlov lost his voice. He tried to speak again, but the lump in his throat kept him from producing anything more than a whisper. I didn't rescue you from that dungeon, only to lose you now. He closed his eyes before the tears could escape. She held his face with both hands now. Fate brought us here, Ludlov. Everything you did for me has led to this moment. He couldn't bear opening his eyes and facing her, and so he stepped back, allowing his face to slip from her fingers. Give me the sickle. No. No. Not yet. Opening his eyes, Ludlov turned to the teacher. Why that fearful response? No. No. Not yet. Only at the very last moment, when Lucas has arrived. Ludlov couldn't stop himself from picturing a tiny Samina facing the great devil himself. The demon who had slain the goddess's only daughter and created hell. He couldn't allow it. He wouldn't. No! No one can do this. She has to die, Ludlov! Adomir had spat out those words with a poisonous fury, and Ludlov's heart sank. 
Ravens have taken the stones down to hell, and now Lucas is on his way. Samina has to fight him. Ravens. Ludlov turned towards Samina. We were there when those stones were stolen. Samina turned her gaze toward her brother. And so are you, Sigurd. Ludlov remembered the masked figure in the Sanctissima and how Samina had been drawn to him. Yes, I was that rider. The stones have been taken to hell by ravens, and you commanded them. Why? If you want to stop Lucus, why do you serve him by bringing him the relics he needs to return? Sigurd's glowing eyes narrowed at that question, like he had just tasted something sour. It was always our intention to lure him out of his lair. Lure him? Ludlov was appalled by the heartlessness, the recklessness, and the sheer arrogance of what Adomir and Sigurd were attempting. But there was a part of him that understood, that even admired their strategy, however much he hated it. By instigating Lucas's return themselves, they would be able to control it and make sure Samina was there to confront him. So you're helping him rise just so you can use me to defeat him? Yes, Samina, and we have done terrible things to achieve it. All of this for you, for your sacrifice. In the last days of this age, the tongue of the goddess will flow away from the earth. Her words will be murdered and forgotten, and men will scorn and burn her. Adomir quoted again from the Prevoronitsian Scriptura Sancta. It was one of the passages that had been excised with the rise of Seven Peaks. I understood from the ancient texts that the Arcanic language needed to be wiped out for Lucas to return. The time of its inevitable downfall was near, so we decided to give the final push through the Magicide Act. It was the only way we could make sure we would be present and prepared for the moment of his return. Rudloff clenched his jaw, frozen with anger. We must control Lucas's return, Rudloff. We must be the masters of this terrible event, so that we can also be the ones to end it. I see a burned man rise. He crushes the heart of the storyteller and casts its ruin into the abyss, calling forth the evil. He will rise. Lucus. Those were the dying words of Sancta Margaretha the Seeress, Ludlov. Ludlov understood. You believe yourself to be this burned man from the prophecy. And you think that with the storyteller's heart you can summon Lucus? Adomir did not reply. You have killed my wife. You have murdered the storyteller. You have ordered Hoskiv to kill every single magic user in this city. He was horrified at his own words, but they were all true. All of this, simply to bring Samina here today, to summon Lucas and kill him? A price worth paying, my old friend. Ludlov drew his rapier, but there was no one to attack. He was powerless against an immortal Adomir, and killing Sigurd was pointless. Adomir would probably just laugh. Ludlov let out a wordless cry of frustration. <laughs> there had to be something he could do. You cannot change the past, Ludlov. Accept it. The time has come for us to safeguard our future. cried a muffled woman's voice from behind a wooden door in the eastern wing in the cathedral. 
The guards looked at each other nervously. Sanctuarium, or the rite of sanctuary, was universal and undeniable, but this was a demonic invasion. Lady Hoskiv approached with a fervent stride. What's going on here? These refugees want to enter the building, my lady. They're invoking the rite of sanctuary. The speaker was Marler. He was a slender, pale man who commanded respect from his fellow guardsmen, despite his unimpressive frame. These are unusual circumstances, lady. That was Helm, Marla's stocky, bearded colleague. If we allow just anyone and everyone to enter, the cathedral will be overrun by people even before the monsters get here. Lady Hoskiv shook her head. She did appreciate Helm's candor. We can't allow everyone to enter, no. But that doesn't mean we can't allow anyone. This is the goddess's cathedral where her laws will be obeyed, is that clear? In her heart, she feared that soon, even the cathedral would no longer be a place of refuge. But she stuck to the belief that she had one final task, and that was to defend the house of the goddess to the last, even against undefeatable monsters. Helm offered no further protest, though he had a hard time hiding his disapproval. The two guards then lifted the wooden bar that barricaded the door and opened it. There stood a thin woman in her early fifties, whose graying dark ponytail was partly loosened so that her face was framed by loose locks of black and silver. Her face and clothing were blackened. Behind her there were about a dozen children. Lady Hoskiv knew right away who they were. It was Freya Hartz and her orphans. Freya's small orphanage was renowned throughout Seven Peaks as a symbol of decency and compassion. It was well known that Miss Hartz went to the very edge of her abilities to care for these children. Some of them had managed to build up rather successful lives after leaving the orphanage. When Hoskiv saw how few children the woman had with her, her heart sank. Come in. She tried to ignore what she felt when she saw the frightened little faces of the children. Freya motioned for them to enter the cathedral, but stayed in the opening herself. Even when the last child had entered, she still stood there. What is it? Freya looked back over the Grand Market, then shot a worried glance at the guardsman and the Grand Cathedral. Don't tell me you left one behind. Give him a chance. Freya's eyes welled up with tears. It's not far anymore. How did this child get left behind in the first place? Hoskiv's voice was tense with impatience. She wanted to help Freya and the orphans, but there was very little time. Gorlivosk had taken temporary control over the proceedings of the battle, but while she trusted him, she knew he did not have the same inspirational qualities she possessed. And in this battle, morale was a precious commodity indeed. Furthermore, the enemy would be near now. Barricades had been stationed around the Grand Market, but they were undermanned. So many troops were still caught up in desperate attempts to keep the enemy at bay. Lady Hoskiv knew it wouldn't be long now before she would have to call them all back to man the barricades, but she wanted to wait. To issue that command essentially meant to give up the rest of Seven Peaks. The city would inevitably be reduced to the cathedral and its immediate surroundings. Her thoughts were interrupted by the appearance of a boy of perhaps ten years old, coughing and panting as he appeared from behind a barricade on the far side of the market. The guard stationed there must have let him through, but Hoskiv couldn't see him. The exhausted lad scrambled over the marketplace as quickly as he could. Hoskiv had never seen a child run so fast. Then she saw the cause of his haste. A shadow was following him. It was a dark cloud in human form. Its unnaturally long arms and legs ending in spindly, clawed fingers and toes. The being had no head, but its outstretched claws were reaching for the child and closing the distance with each passing second. Shoot! Helm called out, drawing the crossbow strapped on his back. Helm shot first, followed by Marla. It didn't matter. While their aim was true, the bolt simply passed through the shadow, clattering down onto the marketplace. The two guardsmen immediately started reloading their weapons, but Hoskiv already knew that the child and its pursuer would be at the cathedral before they would be able to fire again. If the shadow reached the cathedral, 
It would mean the end for all the other children. In sight. Hoskiv pulled Freya in through the doorway. Freya desperately protested, launching herself between Hoskiv and the guards. Hoskiv pulled her arm again more harshly this time. What can you do for him? Freya looked at her. There was an expression of absolute determination in her eyes. Let me go to him, lady. Absolutely not. Let me go before it's too late. Hoskiv loosened her grip, not because she wanted to let Freya go, but because she intended to reason with the woman. Freya immediately shook herself free, however, and she dashed past the guards out of the cathedral. Freya! Then Grand General Hoskiv's heart skipped a beat as a purple glow emanated from the woman's hands. The glow became brighter as she sped over the Grand Market to the boy that had fallen behind. The boy stumbled, and the shadow spread its claws wide like a peacock displaying its feathers. Just as the shadow was ready to grab his prey and consume it, Freya folded her hands and stretched them out towards the creature. The bright light turned into a sudden burst of great purple flames, which formed the image of a winged angel. The angel beat its wings and the shadow was pushed back. The dark creature shrieked, a deafening, desperate sound. It lay still on the stone of the Grand Marketplace. The purple flames became formless again, rose up into the sky, and disappeared. The evil creature lay quiet. Freya huddled over the boy and picked him up. Beneath his tangled shock of dark hair, Hoskiv could see an earring. Sintra. Freya kissed her own thumb, then placed it on the Sintra boy's forehead in blessing. She got up, carrying the boy in her arms, and came back to the doorway. Helm and Marla exchanged nervous glances and turned towards the Grand General. She ignored them and stepped past them out of the doorway. Evidently exhausted and unable to run, Freya hobbled towards her with the boy in her arms. Hoskiv remained patient. May I enter, lady? Hoskiv ignored the woman and looked past her. The black shape had risen again and was beginning to regain the energy to move towards them. Inside, Freya! Run! She turned and ran back to the cathedral, motioning for the guards to let Freya in. His crossbow reloaded, Helm shot once more at the creature as the two women entered with the child, to no avail. Then he receded back into the cathedral and let Marla close the door and barricade it once more. Soon after, a hellish wailing and scratching was heard from outside. Good, Hoskiv thought. The creature cannot enter. At least, it could not on its own. She had no idea what would happen if more demons, or more powerful ones, were to appear at the cathedral's doorstep. Freya set down the boy who was still shivering feverishly. His eyes were wide and his face pale. He was probably still in shock after what he had seen. Kneeling down before him, Freya said, It's all right, Victor. You're safe now. The monster can't get in. It can't hurt you, all right? The boy nodded and hugged her. Freya smiled and got up, still shaking from the exertion of the spell. The other children gathered around the boy, curious and excited about his narrow escape from death. Thank you, my lady, Freya said, her gleaming eyes so filled with gratitude it made Hoskiv uncomfortable. Um, I'm sorry about the magic. I never... It's just... Go inside. We have some provisions for you and your children. The Grand General wouldn't show it, but she felt stunned by what she had seen. The crossbowmen, with their earthly weaponry, would never have managed to defeat this creature. Never. But using magic, Freya had done the impossible. Her deed had not only saved the boy, what would that monster have been able to do if it had entered the cathedral, not weakened by the invocation of that angel? Hoskiv had to admit she didn't know, but if so, then the Angel of Flames had saved even the guardsmen and Hoskiv herself from certain death. Hoskiv had no idea what she would have done if she had been faced with the creature. Physical weapons had proved useless against it, after all. She swallowed hard as the realization dawned on her. No soldier, no witch hunter, no weapon could defeat these things. 
She turned away from the door, quivering. As she entered the welcoming hall of the cathedral, she heard many voices, people asking her questions, but the questions didn't register in her mind. Who was she? What answers did she have? She walked over to the church proper, the heart and most beautiful part of the cathedral, where services were held in normal times. Now, it had turned into a military outpost, full of soldiers and a few witch hunters, ordinary earthly folk in the end. In the enormous stained glass windows, saints were depicted. Hoskiv noticed a window that showed the image of a young woman. Her hand was outstretched high above her head, and bright rays of light issued forth from it, much like the light Freya had managed to summon. An apparently ordinary woman with a surprising gift. The woman shown in the window, though, was Sancta Gwendala, the founder of the Witch Hunter Order. Ludlov had always maintained that the saint had been a mage so powerful that she could weave light and create art with it. A woman with such a knowledge of the arcanic language and its arts that she could heal the wounds of the dying and even command storms. Sancta Gwendala, a magician. Hoskev had always tolerated Ludlov's near blasphemous theories because she had favored him as a witch hunter and a friend, but she had never believed them, even for a moment. For the first time, she doubted. She could not deny what she had seen, nor what she had felt. In that one moment, when Freya had risked her life to banish just one of the thousands of monsters rampaging through the city back to hell, Hoskiv had felt an unmistakable power resonating in her heart. Arcanic power. The power of the goddess. She bit her lips, fighting herself in order to maintain her poise. Had she been wrong then, about all of it, if it was true that only mages could defend Seven Peaks, had she then destroyed the city's only hope through the Magicide Act? Had Ludlov been right? Ludlov. She was reminded of something. Opening the purse on the belt of her uniform, she took out the ring with its enchanted ruby. Ludlov. So that was this week's episode of Witch Hunter. We'll be back next Thursday with the adventures of Ludlov and Samina. If you want to find out more about Witch Hunter, you can find us at audio-epics.com and we also have a Facebook page, the Audio Epics Facebook page. Have a great week, everyone.